Okay, so when most people think about this list, they automatically assume, oh, they have good chocolate, things like that. But I'm here to talk to you that it's more than just that. Switzerland is its own place, its own thing. From everything to the fact that half of their domestic electricity is all comes from hydroelectric power, or the fact that they have one of the lowest crime rates in the world, that's what makes Switzerland Switzerland. My name is Jordan O'Connor, and I am here with the group with my partners, who we are all a group of business consultants. So once again, my name is Jordan O'Connor, and I will be talking about the government of Switzerland. Next is Chelsea David Wallen, who she will be talking about the. Uh, economy of Switzerland. Then there's Demi Young, who will be talking about the infrastructure of Switzerland. Then we will proceed on to Jeffrey Miles, who will be talking about the geography. And lastly, we will go to Sarah View, who will be talking about the culture of Switzerland. So I ask that you hold your questions until the end. We'll have a Q&A session then. And also, thank you. I want to thank the executive board for coming out to hear our presentation about uh, moving on to do business with Switzerland. So first of all, once again, my name is Jordan, and I am a political advisor, and I have lived in Switzerland for the past five years. So I'm going to talk to you briefly about the structure of the government, the federal government itself, and then lastly, I'm going to talk to you about things to keep in mind when you're doing business with the Swiss. So first of all, I'm talking about the structure of the government. It's really different from the United States, but it does have a few similarities. First of all, the government, parliament, and courts are divided into three levels but they are divided upon the federal level, the cantonal level, and the communal level. So that being said, they also have a two-chamber parliament, which is, what similar, is where it reflects the similarities of the House of Representatives and the Senate. The National Council is a 200-member body, and it, it is reflected upon the population of the cantons. Next is the Council of the States, and that is similar to the Senate, but it has 46 members. And each canton can send two members, except for the half cantons, which they can only send one member. Uh, that being said, the Swiss Confederation came into existence in 1848, and it is made up of 26 cantons, though six of them are historically half cantons. And uh, they half cantons were originally large cantons, that three large cantons that they took into thirds, and therefore that's why they're called the half cantons. Next. Um, I want to talk to you about that it's a direct democracy. And according to Swiss World, it's probably one of the most direct democracies in the world because not only can they elect who they want to represent them, but they also can propose legislation. And if they feel that something is unjust, they can voice that opinion and get laws and such revoked. Next, I want to talk to you about the federal government. The federal government is called the Bundesrat, and it is it's unlike a lot of bodies, especially the United States. Instead of having an official federal president, they actually have a seven-member team called the Federal Council, and they make up uh, they make up the governing body. Uh, they also do not have the federal leader, but every year they elect a new member from the team to represent as the president. But major decisions were based on a group consensus or majority vote. And as you can see, these are the seven positions that make up the several uh, make up the council. There is an unofficial there is an unofficial uh, position called the federal camp chancellery, and they just basically attend meetings and help with decisions when needed. But they are not an official position of the federal council. Next, in talking, we're going to talk to you about doing business with the Swiss. Basically, they have an open trade for industrial products. Uh, which is very good, but they have a protected agriculture sector, so they won't do open trade or anything like with that. But they also have this big problem with informal barriers, which is due to the fact that the cantons have a lot of power. Uh, besides dealing with foreign affairs, they can deal with anything they want to do with their barriers. So that can either make it easier or harder to deal with doing business with the Swiss. Um, also, they are part of the EFTA, which according to the European Commission is made up of Liechtenstein, Norway, Switzerland, and Iceland. Uh, and they also do a lot of work with the EU as well. Um, some things to keep in mind though when you're doing business with the Swiss is that they believe in a very peaceful coexistence, so they do not take kindly to violence or things like that. They also have a strong respect for human rights, and they're very outward looking, with the, because they have such a uh, diverse population, but despite the fact that they are very outward looking, they're very ambiguous on whether or not they want to do business with international bodies. 
So that kind of is a little issue, but it's they're very open otherwise to doing trades. So once again, I talked about the structure of the government, the federal government, and things to keep in mind when doing business with the Swiss. So next I'm gonna pass it on to Chelsea, who will be talking to you about the economy. Hello, as Jordan said, my name is Chelsea. I'm a professional economist, and I specialize in European countries. Today I'll be talking about the economy in Switzerland. So just to start things off, I'm gonna talk about a little bit of their background. Of course, uh, Switzerland relies on their banking system. I mean, everybody knows of the Swiss banks. But they also rely heavily on precision manufacturing. They um, manufacture a lot of pharmaceuticals and also a lot of textiles. Um, they also have a long tradition of openness and they welcome foreign investments, and that's very important for if you want to do business there. Um, their government powers are worldly dispersed, and as mentioned earlier by Jordan, they are, their government's made up of a seven member federal council. And according to heritage.org, they joined the UN in 2002. Now next, I have an infograph that I found on heritage.org, and it's about the economy today, and they report that the overall score is at 81 points. Now you can see their ranking is actually fifth on this scale. And it's important to note that the open markets, their trade freedom and investment freedom and financial freedom are remaining constant this year. And also their freedom from corruption has actually gone up to 88 points. Next, I'm gonna talk about their current GDP according to um, the CIA's website, their current GDP is at 632.4 billion, with a 1.9% per, growth rate, a 1.7% five-year compound annual growth rate, and their per capita is $43,370. That's on average per person a year. And also the World Bank likes to um, make a large list of all the GDPs in the world, and on this list last year, Switzerland only rated at um, 20th, below Saudi Arabia, but above Sweden. Next, I'm gonna talk about government spending and their tax. Their tax burden is 29.8% of their total domestic income. Also, the government spending is only 34.7% of their GDP. Now below, I have a graph of their government spending. The top black line is um, the world average, and then the red line is, of course, Switzerland. As you can see, in 1999, it dipped sharply down and then it went back up in 2002 when they joined the UN. Now next I'm going to talk about the labor force. Also according to the CIA's website, the labor force is um, comprised of 4.954 million people, 3.4% um, in agriculture, 23.4% uh, in industries, and 73.2% in services. Lastly, I have these two graphs. The top represents uh, labor freedom and then the bottom is trade freedom. Again, the red line is Switzerland and the black line is the world average. As you can see in both graphs, Switzerland remains constant above both the world averages. Um, thank you. That concludes the economy section. Um, I talked about their GDP and their current economic trends. And now I'm going to pass it off to Demi to talk about the infrastructure. Um, my name is Demi, and I'm a sociologist. I have been living in Switzerland, Switzerland for four years now, and I'm an expert on the infrastructure of Switzerland. Today I will talk to you about the transportation, healthcare, and communication in Switzerland. Now, Switzerland is very well known for having, uh, and has the densest and most efficient railway system network in the world. According to Trade and Investment Handbook of Switzerland, there are 2,791 miles of railway rail lines in Switzerland. Each train holds um, 5,000 passengers on average, and this railway network reaches all surrounding countries. This includes Germany, Austria, and France. There are 44,000 miles of roadways. Um, however, the Swiss are very environmentally aware, and they, to reduce pollution, they do tax larger vehicles. However, this mostly um, applies to large trucks that transport goods through Switzerland. Um, also, something to consider is that in Switzerland, people do drive on the other side of the road than here in the States. So that's something we would have to educate our workers on. Um, also, airports. There are 65 airports in Switzerland. Two of the major airports are in Zurich and Geneva. Zurich is, 
consistently receives recognition for high standards in service and is number three in the world. Next, I will talk about Switzerland. Oh, and as you can see in this picture, um, our workers will have a beautiful view on the way to work. Okay, next I will talk about healthcare. Now, it is compulsory for every citizen who lives in Switzerland to have healthcare. Um, this is required within the first three months of living in Switzerland. Now, according to Internations, 99.5% of all residents of Switzerland do have health insurance in coverage. Um, unlike most other nations, citizens are not taxed for health care, and also um, it is not partly financed by employers. Every um, citizen and patient can freely choose their doctor um, as well as any hospital they want to go to. Um, they also have direct access to specialists and don't have to go through consultations with doctors or family doctors. They can freely walk into any private or public hospital as needed and receive treatment. Also, both public and private hospitals meet and well exceed international healthcare standards in the world. Lastly, I will talk about communication um, in Switzerland. So 120 mobile phone subscribers per 100 inhabitants um, are now available since 2007 in Switzerland um, from according to countries request, current countries quest, I'm sorry. And over 77% of households um, have broadband internet access. Also, everything's really similar. Everyone has a cell phone, television, and radio are just as common there as it is here in the U.S. And there is Wi-Fi all over, um, of course, in big hubs such as airports, train stations, and um, shopping centers. Uh, thank you all very much. My name is Demi, and today I covered just a quick recap, transportation, healthcare, and communication, and I will now pass it on to Jeffrey, who will talk about geography. Thank you, Debbie. Like Debbie and Jordan said, my name is Jeffrey Miles, and I've been a tour guide in Switzerland for over five years now. And I have been in two and led tours in all of the cities I will cover in this presentation. Uh, specifically, the three points I will cover are the specific location of Switzerland, I will cover the climate, and I will also cover a couple of tourist hotspots where you may be interested in um, visiting. So my first point, is the specific location. It is a landlocked area. It is right here, if you can see, right between France, Germany, Austria, and Italy. This little orange country right here. Um, this is a bigger map, so you can see. Uh, like I said, it is a landlocked uh, country, although there are several lakes uh, found. It is also covered 65% by Alps, and of those Alps, 44% of those Alps are covered by glaciers, ice, stuff like that. There are four main Alps in Switzerland, the Bernice Alps, Laris Alps, the Pennine Alps, and the Levantine Alps. The highest point in the Alps is Monte Rosa, which is around this area bordering Italy is in the Benign Alps. Next, I will talk about uh, the climate of Switzerland. Uh, all this information can be uh, found by climate zone. It is very temperate depending on where or how high you are in, in the mountains. Obviously, it gets colder. Uh, in the winters, it, it gets, it's very cold. It's where you see pictures of Switzerland, it's always snowing. And, yeah. Was, is not just a blizzard country. It, it does rain, it does snow sometimes in the winter. Um, in the summers, it's beautiful. It's not too hot as you get the extreme heat here in Texas. It's not like if you want to get away, it's a cool, uh, like, very adaptable temperature. Also, there will be occasional showers. Next, I'm going to talk to you about uh, tourist hotspots. A uh, big hotspot is Bern, which is the 
capital of Switzerland. Zurich and Geneva, uh, as Demi mentioned, Zurich is, is a huge hotspot. If, if you go to Zurich and Geneva, usually you are looking for uh, cultural experiences such as museums, theaters, uh, international corporations, and opera houses. Next is Stad, it's more of a younger scene. You go there for, you know, it's a fun location. There are a couple of resorts there. Um, also, it's a good nightlife in Stad. So, if you're looking to go have some fun while you're not working your day off or something like that, you can go to Stad and have a great time. Also, if you uh, bring the family a couple of places to check out and go see uh, some of the scenery, Switzerland has some beautiful scenery. Uh, the first is Rhine Falls. It's kind of like Niagara Falls of Switzerland. It, I will show you on a map in a bit. Right here, if you can see, is an image of Brian Falls. It's basically the waterfall here. And then this uh, strip of land is sort of like a little mountain. So, and these are little people in there, so you can go up there and you view the waterfall from a different perspective in this area view. Next is the Shalom Castle, right here, and that's located on the other side of Switzerland, the Rhine Falls. It is, uh, according to JAMA, or J-A-M-A Academic Journal, it was called, it was uh, based, on, based on a poem written by Lord Byron in the early, early 19th century. It, the poem is called The Prisoner of Shalom, and it's attributed uh, to Lord Byron and his three other friends that went to the Shalom Castle basically party, have a great, had a great time. Now, really quickly, I'm gonna go back and show you where these can be located. Rye Falls are up here in the north of uh, Switzerland. And down here, you see this little star is where you can find the castle of Shalom. Uh, both very beautiful sites. Today, I talked about um, the specific location of Switzerland. I also talked about the climate, what you can expect weather-wise and when you take uh, trips there. Also, I talked about a couple of tourist hotspots, what may uh, satisfy your interests when you're not working or even having beautiful scenery when you are working. So I'd like to thank you all and I'm gonna pass it to Sarah who's gonna talk to you about culture. Thank you, Jeff. Sorry. Hello, my name is Sarah. Um, I am an international trade and customs manager. I had the privilege of working at, in Switzerland last year, and I'd like to share with you some aspects about their culture um, that's very interesting and they're very diverse. So I'll talk about their language, their general business etiquette, and also I'll talk about some of their customs and festivals. So to start off, they actually have four official languages in Switzerland. Uh, according to Swiss Info, which is a branch, branch of the Swiss Broadcasting Corporation, so, so, uh, the four main languages are French, German, Italian, and Romansh. German is spoken by about 64%, so that's the majority of all the languages. Uh, next up is French, which is spoken about 20%. Italian 7% and Romanche is less than 1%. And the most notable linguistic fact about this is uh, German speaking in Switzerland actually uses their own dialect for communication. So that's called Swiss German, but when they're writing, it's they use standard German. And that, next I'll talk about their, no, their major ethnic group, groups, which coincide with their languages. Um, Here's a map that is brought to you by All About Switzerland Information website. And you can see that Swiss German is definitely a large portion of Switzerland. And then French is the second largest, and Italian as a smaller one. And Romanche is kind of more spread out. But there are some other minority languages as well. But for those of you who don't speak any of those four languages, there's still hope because uh, for many multinational 
corporations, they do use English, especially if they're dealing with English-speaking customers. And also, since there's so many different languages in the corporate world, they, they instead of trying to communicate between Italian, French, and German, they just resort to English as a common language. Next, I'll talk about some bit business etiquette. It's not too different from American etiquette. Um, titles and greeting people, since there are so many diverse languages and people, you need to um, be concerned about how you address them. Uh, for French speakers, instead of saying Mister, you would say Monsieur, and for for women, you would use Madame or Mademoiselle. And for Swiss German speakers, you'd say Herr for Mister and Frau for Miss. And for Italian speakers, you'd say Signor for Mister or Signora for Miss. And you should always wait to be invited to use their first name uh, instead of starting out that way. Um, and there's no set pro protocol for exchanging business cards. Um, that's, that's, there's not that here either. Um, the address for men and women, they're very conservative, but they also like to stay stylish by not having anything too flamboyant. So men, uh, stylish suits, uh, shirts and ties is great. Um, a jacket tie, you know, that's good too. Um, for women, stylish and conservative, suits, dresses, or blouses with a skirt, and accessories are usually worn, but again, subtle, not too eyeballing or um, out there. And they value very much clean, nicely pressed clothes and polished shoes. For their meetings, um, you should definitely be on time for those. And you can expect some preliminary small talk with French and Italian people, but generally German people like to get straight down to the point. And um, they actually take their meetings quite seriously and uh, have a strict agenda for this. Next, I will talk about their customs and festivals. Uh, I wanted to talk about Christmas because it's coming up and they actually have a, a pretty unique celebration that they do for, in the Catholic areas, they have a celebration on St. Nicholas's feast day, December 5th, where they will actually have St. Nicholas come by on a donkey with gifts for the children. And as part of the older folklore, they have a little sinister type character that goes around helping St. Nicholas. Um, but they have him there kind of to keep track of the children that don't behave over the year. <laughs> And uh, the next is the Vazel Carnival, um, which is one of the most extravagant traditions in Switzerland. It actually starts at um, 4 a.m. The Morgenstruck, the end. Uh, this is heralding the start of the festivities in the city. And what they do is they turn off all the lights in the city, street lights, and then you can hear piccolos and drums, and they have a procession of masked characters with playing music. And um, this actually happens in the city on the Rhine. And um, the festivities last all day, and restaurants and other uh, types of businesses will partake in this as well. And this date, tradition of this dates back all the way to the 14th century. It's held on Monday following Ash Wednesday. And um, yeah. And the Up and Up is a popular music festival. Uh, this is a, information according to myswitzerland.com. It's uh, the medieval center of Appenzel is the venue of the annual Swiss popular music festival, where over 40 popular music groups from every corner of the country will get together and have a festival of music. And this is the ideal opportunity to take in for the best performances that you can find in Switzerland. So uh, thank you very much for being here. Uh, I, I talked about the Switzerland's languages, their general business etiquette, and also some of their customs and exciting events. So now I'll hand it back to Jordan to recap. Okay, so. In conclusion, my name is Jordan O'Connor, and I talked about the different government structure and how it varied from the United States. The next was Chelsea David Llewellyn, who spoke about the economy and how 
the work freedom and labor freedom was above world standards. Next was Demi Young, who spoke about the infrastructure and how having healthcare is a compulsory thing for being Swiss. Uh, then was Jeffrey Miles, who spoke about how Switzerland was a landlocked country. And lastly, it was Sarah View, who discussed how Switzerland had four main languages because of its diversity. So once again, thank you for coming. Um, and after all of our research, we have based that it would be best to continue doing business with the Swiss. So once again, thank you for coming, and we'll now be taking questions.